Welcome to the SICA cast. This is Fred Iantorno, Executive Director of SICA. In today's presentation, Chuck Olson of uh, AirPro Di Diagnostics will share some insights on interpreting and documenting scan data, trouble codes, and calibration. Chuck uh, has 40 years of experience in the automotive repair and technologies industry. He's a 36-year advanced level ASE master technician with extensive experience in research and development and operations management. He has contributed to several GM service committees, including the OnStar Advisory Council. Chuck currently, currently serves at, uh, on several industry committees uh, relating to emerging technologies and technical training, uh, including CIC, SCRS, uh, NASTF, ETI, and Florida State College of Jacksonville. Chuck's current role as Executive Director of Operations at AirPro Diagnostics allows him every opportunity to expand his knowledge of the products and applications of new technologies. Today's latest uh, advancements have his interest focused on getting knowledge and technology resources in the hands of service providers to meet the needs of continuing developments for remote diagnostics, calibrations, and programming procedures, mostly for the art of it. During the webinar, if you have any questions, uh, please type your questions in the uh, webinar navigation pane. We will answer as many of, uh, as possible at the end of the presentation. I want to thank everyone for spending your time with us today and for Chuck for sharing his insight and expertise with us. I'll now turn this over to our presenter, Chuck Olson. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Fred, and uh, thank you so much to uh, Sika for the opportunity uh, uh, to share this with everybody and everybody for uh, for tuning in today. So it's uh, just kind of want to start things off a little bit uh, uh, with uh, with a little bit more on my history in automotive. So it's uh, uh, when I got involved in automotive, it was in the uh, early to mid '70s. And uh, the first time I looked at the bottom of a matchbox car, it's, uh, I knew what I was going to do the rest of my career. <clears throat> uh, my father was an aviation technician and inspector uh, in the military. So uh, a lot of my upbringing uh, was related to his studies that he was doing in aviation mechanics. And uh, uh, I really enjoyed reading the technical manuals that my dad brought home. So uh, most of my reading uh, wasn't fiction. It was... Uh, uh, diving into technical manuals, learning how to uh, read a slide rule, and uh, uh, that kind of thing. So it's uh, with collision and what we're facing in collision is uh, it, it's hit the collision industry very, very quickly. And uh, coming up through uh, the mechanical portion of the repairs, we had the advantages of seeing the technology progression uh, from early onboard diagnostic systems that didn't use a scan tool at all a lot of different tools, and then the introduction of scan tools. And uh, interestingly enough, the first scan tools that came into the market uh, uh, were aftermarket scan tools that uh, uh, quickly were adopted for dealer service tools. So it uh, went through the introduction of the GM Tech 1, Tech 2, then GDS 2, and then module programming. So it's uh, with that, we'll, uh, we'll go ahead and get started. Let's uh, go ahead next, Fred. So we got the next slide up, Fred? Yeah. Okay, so it's, uh, I'm not seeing it on my end, so it's, I'll take your cue there. So it's, uh, <clears throat> one of the first things that uh, I, I would like uh, everybody to think about uh, before we get started is just imagine that you have a 2013 Chevrolet Cruze that comes into your shop for repair. And uh, it's, uh, it's, a left impact, it's a left rear impact, uh, looks fairly minor, but uh, how you're going to go forward with the approach to repairing this uh, this vehicle. And I'm going to be going over a case study later on in the presentation. But uh, starting here is uh, what is in there that we need? <clears throat> so today's vehicles, and even those going back more than two decades, contain a wealth of electronic information to help us do our jobs effectively and efficiently. <clears throat> we need this information to help answer the why questions. And the why questions may be, why is that warning lamp on? Or why is the air conditioning not working? Or the headlamps not coming on? If we don't look for all the clues that are there, 
the problem and uh, uh, within the system for the problem to be solved make is much more difficult than it has to be. So we need to know what the systems in the car can tell us. Clues to these problems will be found by asking the car what is in there. And we can get answers to such of these questions as which systems respond, diagnostic trouble codes, failure records, history recordings, snapshot or freeze frame data associated with certain DTs, and even events that did not set a DTC, depending on how the vehicle was designed and programmed to behave. Then we can fill in the blanks and decide where we need to go next. So uh, how do we get to it <clears throat> is, uh, is the next question. So there are some options and methods uh, with the most common being using a capable scan tool. For many in the industry and uh, a lot of people I've been speaking with, uh, uh, there's a certain mystique and uh, a friend or foe in relating to, uh, to scan tools and what they can do. So the scan tool is a critical component of strategy-based diagnostics. They give order and method on how we diagnose service and reprogram these increasingly complex interrelated systems to restore vehicles to sound operating condition. So with that, <clears throat> All right, give me just a moment here. So with that, we're gonna talk about uh, accessing the raw electronic data and the, uh, the scan tool. And by no means are the, uh, the scan tool and the scan tool data uh, definitive or infallible. Understanding and being able to fully employ the functionality available to us in modern and emerging scan tools are acquired skills. If our knowledge and skills do not keep pace with technology changes and the associated scan tool functionality, our awareness or lack thereof of uh, what we know what a tool can do or cannot do will be a two-edged profit sword. So access to and sharing the collective data will improve the process as a whole. However, it does come as a cost, but this cost will be uh, offset by improvement in other areas. So a little bit more on access accessing the, uh, uh, the raw data. So the raw data is uh, managed by several different uh, uh, specifications. And I'm gonna go over some of these specifications and using a scan tool and doing diagnostics, it isn't, you don't necessarily have to know the definition of every one of these, you just need to know that they're there. So this is like ISO 9141, which is an international specification, 14230, SAEJ1850, uh, two different types, CAN controller area network, ISO uh, 15765, which is CAN, and uh, SAE 12610. So all of these can be characterized as languages. And these are languages that the vehicle uh, must, must adhere to in order to communicate. So it's a more in layman's terms, it's uh, you need the tool that can speak these languages. It's uh, So if you're speaking English and you're trying to interview somebody who speaks French, you need an interpreter in, or, in order to do that and do that effectively. So on this page of accessing the raw data, there's several examples of uh, uh, vehicle communication interfaces, uh, all-inclusive scan tools, which incorporate a built-in vehicle communication interface, and then some examples of uh, scan tool uh, applications. So and I'm gonna also talk about one very important specification here and which relates to the vehicle communication interfaces, which in the middle of the screen is a, uh, is a green unit made by Bosch. There's a GM unit at the top middle. Uh, there is the, uh, the red one, which is a Ford BCI unit. And then next to the Ford is a uh, GM Tech 2, which is one that is uh, completely, uh, that has incorporated the vehicle communication interface and the handheld device. So the J2534 uh, communication interface standard was designed by the Society of Automotive Engineers and mandated by the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency for vehicle ECU programming. 
uh, that was its initial purpose. And then to create a standard interface to communicate with scan pool applications, which is a software, to be adopted by all vehicle manufacturers, allowing independent aftermarket the ability to reprogram, diagnose, access data from vehicle ECUs without the need for a special dealer-only tool. The pass-through device manufacturer supplies the hardware, the appliance and the cable that connects to and communicates with the vehicle network. And then the OEMs provide the scan tool application programs available for independent purchase and user license agreements. And uh, those are all housed by a common uh, PC and uh, Windows-based uh, uh, program, which has to meet minimum specifications to run the OEM software applications. So some of the performance app, uh, attributes of these uh, VCIs is they must be efficient, dependable of handling high-speed communication access and automotive systems that is crucial to provide better real-time performance in terms of timeliness, bandwidth utilization, and the ability to count for communication delays, especially for systems that require high data rate access. To satisfy these demands of functionalities within the, uh, the vehicle and the different vehicle communications, gonna expand a little bit on some of those specifications, uh, but they have names, and you may have heard these names, of a controller area network known as CAN, local interconnect network, which is known as LIN, byte flight, media-oriented system transport, which is called MOST, which is usually related to uh, entertainment systems. And then we have some future communication protocols that are coming into play, such as time-triggered control area network, which is TTCAN, and uh, FlexRay, FDCAN, and is what's been announced uh, here lately is a move of some of the manufacturers going into the Ethernet connection. So to relate both the communication requirements of an in-vehicle system and the characteristics of communication protocols, uh, these performance uh, attributes must be addressed for uh, flexibility, pre predictability, dependability, and the extension of the network in order to communicate with the vehicle. So some of these terms are very general. But to simplify it, a VCI must be capable of communicating in several languages over several channels, and those channels are the pins of the DLC port, or also known as the OBD2 port. Uh, Thirteen of those pins, or we will call them channels, uh, <coughs> normally have the uh, designated communication channels. So it's a, that, that's some of the in-depth of uh, description of what the scan tools are and the differences between the vehicle communication interface and the software application uh, that is separate and apart from the VCI, but they need to work in concert in order to, uh, uh, to go together. So let's uh, go ahead on the next slide. So let's, uh, at, uh, I'm gonna go a little bit further here and I'm going to uh, explain a little bit with aftermarket scan tools uh, versus OEM scan tools. That's a question that I do get asked a lot. So today, aftermarket scan tools are competitive uh, with dealer OEM scan tools. However, they are not exactly the same. I'm not an advocate of, uh, of one over the other. However, it's necessary to understand the strengths and weaknesses of each and to know your tools. There are certain functions, procedures, and OEM certification requirements that will dictate when OEM scan tool applications are your only option. Not one aftermarket scan tool today can do everything on all vehicles, and the same is true with an OEM scan tool. So the, uh, the key is in the mix of uh, the vehicles that you're servicing. Uh, to pick the tools on the brands that your shop specializes in, if any, and then use the correct tool or service for the job at hand. The caveat, make sure that you know what your tools can and cannot do. Some functionality may have been given up in order to achieve a lower price point. You have to have access to the dealer tool when needed or be prepared to be honest with yourself about what your shop cannot do and be prepared to sublet or decline the job. Honesty still resonates as a reason for your customers to do business with you. And my view is reality. So be careful with your tool selections as you go, as you go forward. 
So it's, uh, with that, going on to the uh, next area of data is the service information. I'm sorry, can you back up uh, one there, Fred, on the service information? So for every single repair, research is, is required. <clears throat> and that is, is sourced from the OEM, uh, from third-party suppliers that, uh, that purchase the service information and repost it on a common format. Uh, similar to how an aftermarket tool licenses OEM scan tool information. Uh, there will be times that you def definitely have to go to the OEM direct subscription in order to get the latest information. So you have to, you must review every repair and procedure that will be performed on a vehicle to identify calibration or programming procedures that will need to be performed with the scan tool and also determine that the scan tool being used is capable of the procedure. So an important uh, uh, part of this I want to elaborate a little bit is the uh, uh, scanning a vehicle in most cases is not going to alert you that a calibration is needed or must be performed. Uh, this needs to be focused on and found within service information. The only exception that you can count on a scan tool telling you that if a calibration needs to be performed is if a component has been replaced that has never been calibrated. That at those points, it, a lot of times will set a code to alert you to the calibration, but you can't count on it. You have to go to the service information, review the repair procedures, the parts that you replaced. If you have changed, uh, removed and reinstalled a sensor, change an angle or mounting of a sensor or change the thrust angle of a vehicle, you're going to have to use your service information to let you know when the calibration needs to be done. And then you need a capable scan tool in order to execute that calibration. So next. As we go forward and uh, with the vehicles, like I said, that a lot of this information has uh, has been available in these vehicles for the last two decades. <clears throat> but the skills of the uh, of the user and knowing your tools is uh, is is what you need to know. So, what's uh, the complexity of today's tools provides ample opportunity for a scan tool to miss control units or DTCs during a general health check of a vehicle. And that's uh, scanning all control units at once. So uh, uh, scan tools have many functions and many different ways that they can be used. But the most common is doing a pre-scan or doing a post-scan or what is known as a health check of a vehicle. So the, uh, the opportunity to miss uh, uh, some of these codes or some of these modules. So there's two distinct different reasons for this. Next. So non-recording control units can be filtered out by some scan tools. This uh, isn't this is rare, isn't necessarily the case, but you must be aware of it when you're using a, when you're using a scan tool, whether independently or using a service. If you're using a service, the person that is driving the scan tool and using it must be aware of this as well and be very diligent on what they're looking at. So what, uh, normally when these non-reporting modules can be filtered out, it's caused by an impact at or near the area of the control unit. Could be a damaged wire harness, a connector damaged, blown fuses, or poor ground connections. So that's, uh, uh, it comes very important. So your general health check is, uh, is kind of the starting point, but being able to use the scan tool beyond that is really necessary. Next. Another reason is busy automotive network or the control unit uh, returning information slowly because of a large uh, amount of data that is stored in that module. Uh, modules have uh, timing parameters that must be adhered to. And at times, and, the, and again, this can happen with uh, uh, several OEM scan tools and aftermarket scan tools as well, is while that module is returning with that large trouble code record, that uh, request can time out and the scan tool will move on and possibly miss things. Uh, so that's when it's necessary to check systems individually on a vehicle or, uh, or go back and rerun a scan on a vehicle multiple times to make sure that everything was received. Next. And uh, again, reiterate that both OEM and aftermarket scan tools are subject to this. 
Uh, depending on the scan tool, scan tool selection, uh, some of them are uh, exposed to uh, uh, this symptom of uh, missing a control module than others. And uh, this is the main reason why there are usually so many updates with scan tools. Uh, OEM scan tools update very, very frequently, and aftermarket scan tools frequency of updates have uh, increased in the last couple of years. Next slide. So wrong option content reported in a scan tool database. So this would be a build list determined by the scan tool via the software's internal database. And uh, we'll, we'll see a little bit of an example and a disclaimer as we go uh, forward into the case study of, uh, of where this can happen. And, uh, and again, you need to be aware of this and really paying attention of what it is that you're reading on a scan tool when you're using it. Next. So build sheets or vehicle option content can be incorrect. Uh, it's, uh, nothing is infallible. So some of these build sheets, when uh, you're referring to them, and uh, the next one, please, Fred. Usually where we see this happen is added accessories or, or option modification by a dealership or the aftermarket once the vehicle uh, leaves the factory. We have cases to where uh, a customer wants fog lamps installed, and the fog lamps may be installed and installed at the dealer level. Uh, these will not be included on the uh, vehicle option content list and may or may not be accessible by the scan tool uh, unless you go into that system by itself. And aftermarket changes can, uh, can happen as well. This can also happen when uh, uh, customers opt for heated seat installation when the model they chose, it's the right color, but they want heated seats. And uh, uh, dealers will either install those uh, heated seats or sometimes uh, cannibalize another vehicle and uh, do a switch in order to make a sale for a customer. So it's, uh, uh, paying attention to what is on the vehicle by inspections is very necessary. Next. So how we overcome these issues, and uh, uh, this has been uh, something with several different people we've been discussing a lot, and uh, we gave a name to it, which is component level scanning. So this is, uh, this is much different than uh, reading trouble codes. Next. So it's, uh, as we've been discussing, the DTCs are just a starting point of drilling down to a problem on a vehicle. And each system is made up of a group of components. And it's also important to understand that several components are inputs within a system and uh, steering angle sensor is one that comes to mind that uh, used to be an input strictly for the vehicle stability system. Now we have active lighting. Active lighting will use that steering angle sensor input. Uh, ADAS systems, lane keep assist, uh, we'll use that steering. So now that steering angle sensor input is integrated into several different systems of a vehicle. So it's, uh, so that's important to be aware of the group of components in each system that you're diagnosing on a vehicle. Next. So what we do with component level scanning is we get as close to the raw data or the live data as possible. And we focus on the plausible data, like voltage, uh, voltage references, and a voltage reference can be uh, a five volt reference, a seven volt reference, or a 12 volt reference, depending on what the system uh, uh, is operating on. Uh, bidirectional controls, a uh, bidirectional control can be testing a system, a system's output. Uh, and this again comes from a capable scan tool. Uh, many very high level aftermarket scan tools are capable of this as well as the OEM scan tools. That would be something like commanding a cooling fan to come on or commanding a uh, air conditioning compressor to activate or opening a window when you have a symptom on a vehicle of something not working. Uh, this makes your diagnostics much easier to be able to test the outputs uh, using this raw data and live data. And then, of course, you can read live voltages and resistances. Uh, an example of, uh, of a resistance, and this is something that uh, may or may not set a trouble code, uh, would be in an airbag system. Capable scan tools, when you're evaluating an airbag system, uh, will show you the resistance value 
of the uh, deployable devices on the vehicle. And they have a value that they should be in. And once they exceed that value, that's when it will set a diagnostic trouble code or turn on a light. However, if you see something that is on the margin when you're reviewing that data, uh, say for instance, it's, uh, it, the norm is 2.2 ohms, it sets a code at 3.5 ohms, and you're reading it's at 3.4 ohms, uh, you can determine that you have an issue going on with that circuit that may or may not be related to uh, what you're working on, but you need to be aware of it because uh, that system is right on the edge of setting a diagnostic trouble code. And uh, that's another function of component level scanning. So with that, that gives us the ability that uh, by reviewing this very closely, we can determine faults before they are re reported by the controller by either turning on a light uh, uh, or setting a diagnostic trouble code. And so it's uh, going further with diagnostic trouble codes. Uh, codes can be set that uh, are in a pending status, which means the system has self-tested and failed the test once, and the uh, computer system or the built-in diagnostics of the vehicle isn't satisfied that that is a fault yet. So it's going to retest that system when the conditions are met. If that system fails uh, a second consecutive time, then it may turn on a trouble code or that code may turn to current. And uh, this is dependent, again, on the system. Uh, for an airbag control system, those are usually continuously monitoring which means as soon as it fails, it, sh it should be alerting the customer. Uh, and uh, conditional monitoring means conditions must be met before the system will self-check. So I'll use an example of a, uh, of a backup sensor on a vehicle. So you have a vehicle that's been hit in the rear, has uh, uh, taken out some of the uh, uh, sonar sensors that are in the back of that car, and that car's picked up never been put into reverse, uh, has never been cycled to, put in reverse, or backed up, you can scan that car and you will not have a diagnostic trouble code telling you that there's a problem with those uh, rear sensors until the conditions have been met to self-test. By looking at the data, you can see that the data is out of specifications and prompt you to go ahead and test that system. And that's what's so important about component level scanning. So what's up uh, next? Uh, this is an example that uh, uh, that we use with our technicians as we're analyzing different systems. This is an active cruise control system and how the interrelated parts uh, uh, are related. So we got the control area network. We got the ACC sensors that are specific inputs to the active cruise control, drivetrain control, transmission control, driver controls and outputs, and all the systems that they affect. So when you're using a scan tool, using component level scanning, uh, this level of understanding of the systems and continuously studying and, and understanding these emerging technologies is critical to use the scan tool effectively. Next. So analyzing all these uh, uh, different types of data, so it's, uh, I separated these in a little bit of a of, uh, of, of sections. Uh, next. So we have visual. So uh, the, and visual, what you see on the car when you inspect the car, that's part of data and it's a type of data. So what is broken? What is leaking? What is inoperative? Uh, those, those kind of things. Next. We have symptoms. So a malfunction indicator is a, is a symptom. Uh, customer input, functional checks, those kind of things are uh, also going to be uh, inputs in the, uh, into the system that you need to be aware of. Next. I'm just a minute here. My screen just went blank on me. So, okay, I got it back. So, and, uh, and again, the function checks of the vehicle on the symptoms. Uh, next slide. It's a service. Uh, 
Okay, hold on to me here for a minute. I think I may have lost connection temporarily. Okay, the service is up there now. Service, and I can back it up. Service information is up there now. Okay, so uh, on the uh, on the service information. I'm catching up with you here. Yeah, the service information is our inspection requirements, our repair procedures, the testing procedures, the option content, and the calibration requirement. The, uh, and then, of course, the electronic data from the vehicle, which we've been talking about a, uh, a lot throughout uh, this information. So what, uh, using the capable tools, documenting the tool that you're using, uh, the diagnostic trouble codes, live data stream vehicles, and calibration verification. So all these types of data have to be considered as you're going through a strategy-based diagnostics uh, uh, process. So next. So this is a case study that we're talking about on the, uh, what I asked you to think about at the beginning. You got a 2013 Chevy Cruze that's come in uh, with a rear impact. Next. The pre-scan DTCs and system analysis uncovered some issues on this car. So this car comes in, all the customer knows is I've got a rear impact. Uh, no other information is really given to the shop and you've got a, a, uh, a a rear collision repair that uh, you need to take care of on this vehicle. So with this, a pre-scan being done, the, uh, uh, the scan tool and the DTCs alone could not get it done. Additional resources, including access to OEM bill data, option content, and on-vehicle inspections were needed to determine the correct repair plan. Uh, Fred, am I, uh, am I at the right place where you're displaying? I lost yes. uh, connection on your yeah. display. Yeah, we're at okay. OEM calibration. Okay. Yep. Yeah, OEM calibration files uh, on this particular car was needed uh, for replacement and module programming. And you'd wonder why did we need uh, module programming on this vehicle with rear bumper repair. Next. Yep. You're good. So post repair programming, scan proceed and uh, scan procedures with reinitializations, code clearing, and function checks verified the correct repair on time with this case study. So let's take a look at uh, what we got coming up next. So yep. next, we're on pre repair inspection scan. So yes. the overall results were 31 fault codes were recorded, several modules were not reporting, and uh, the scan tool. The scan tools do not determine optional equipment. Uh, there are a few exceptions out there that, can, that are very helpful with optional equipment, but you can't count on the scan tool to help you with that. So access to build data and or a vehicle inspection is needed uh, on this vehicle, and you'll see from the results. Next. Mm -hmm. Next, two clicks. So we've got the inspection scan results, and I've got highlighted in yellow some uh, areas of uh, areas of concern here with a lot of communication codes. Next. So several communication faults and modules are not reporting on this vehicle. So it's, uh, that's of uh, that's of concern on this. Next. Two clicks. So now we're going to get into analyzing the results individually. So it's a, for the purpose of display, uh, these are results of a uh, OEM scan tool, a GM uh, vehicle scan tool, and the exact same results were found with an aftermarket scan tool as well, except for programming. So next we see non-related issues in the body control module with the keyless entry transmitter. So we're going through this vehicle system by system. Uh, notice under the body control modules that object detection modules and other non-reporting non modules aren't listed. So this body control module is alerting you that I don't have communication with modules that I expect to see. Next. And next should be showing instrument cluster on the screen, Fred. Oh, 
let me go back then. Yeah, I got it now. Okay. So what, uh, and then next one more time, notice again that the object detection modules and other non-reporting modules aren't listed here again under the instrument panel cluster. Next, and we have the recommendation of inspect, charge, and test the battery. So what, uh, with the scan, the vehicle battery is four years old. Uh, if this needs inspection, if the battery is damaged, it's a rear collision, so we doubt it's damaged. So we need to advise the customer of the state of their battery with this being four years old and give the customer the opportunity to replace their battery while it's in the shop and uh, advise them of that condition. Next. Electronic, Next. electronic break. Yep, that's it. One And uh, so with here, now here's a list of a lot of the modules that are not reporting. Click. We would expect to see some of these modules as standard, but some are optional. And additional information is going to be needed from a build sheet or close visual inspection. Next. Two clicks. Do we have inflatable restraint? Yeah, we're on inflatable restraint. Yep. And then next. We show two of these modules are optional. The HVAC control module, which if it's a uh, manual HVAC system, it won't have an HVAC control module. And parking assist control module, that is optional as well. Next. This inflatable restraint, this is of concern. However, the shop verifies that the airbag lamp bolt checks normally. Uh, so during the communications of doing this scan, it is noted that we have normal behavior of the inflatable restraint uh, bulb check, which comes on for a few seconds and then goes out. So that indicates the system should be working, but we've got no response from the module. Next, two clicks. So now we're down to the object detection module. Next. Recommendation. The object detection, yeah, I should be on showing the object detection modules and the uh, explanation that the object detection modules are optional. So without a build sheet that includes option content or inspection, the first assumption is the vehicle is not equipped. Next. We're going to go through the recommendations that are, are made for additional work on this vehicle from these scan results. Next. So this vehicle needs close visual inspection and or network pinpoint diagnostics. Next. We need to inspect, charge, and test the battery. Next. We need to inspect and verify optional equipment. Next. We need to reconnect for a completion scan after repairs are complete. Next. Programming of replacement modules may be needed. At this point with recommendations with further inspection of the vehicle, that is not, cannot be fully determined at this point. Next. We need to recheck all system functions. Next. Perform system reinitializations. Next and clear all codes set by the repair process. And notice these are all additional steps that go on with uh, with this vehicle, using the scan tool and additional procedures, which uh, again is much more than reading diagnostic codes and clearing diagnostic codes. Next, yeah, it's gonna be two clicks, Fred. It uh, should have the vehicle build sheet. Yeah, we got it now. Okay, so uh, looking at this vehicle build sheet, and this, this was retrieved from the General Motors uh, uh, vehicle and query system, uh, and this is also available for aftermarket through the uh, a subscription to the General Motors programming service site. So on the top left, just below the vehicle build, you'll see the option content and the disclaimer that this is not a definitive source of GM vehicle RPO information. It is intended for service reference only. 
Uh, if there are any questions, it uh, sends you to the invoice or window sticker on the vehicle, uh, which is rarely going to be available. However, this is a really good source. I highlighted the uh, sections of this vehicle, and again, this is a 2013 Chevrolet Cruze, uh, and it's very highly optioned. We normally wouldn't expect to see these many options. So it does have heated seats. It has an enhanced safety package, ultrasonic rear park assist, and side, blown, side blind zone alert, which is the uh, traffic alert. Next. So in the inspection of this vehicle it's, uh, and the damaged rear bumper cover, which was removed, uh, the left side uh, object detection module is missing. Uh, why it's missing, whether it's knocked out during the impact, came out, it's hard to say, but uh, nonetheless, it, uh, it is definitely missing. Next slide. Now let's take a closer look at this nasty connector. <clears throat> Now, uh, this connector that uh, connects to that uh, uh, blind spot module is also part of the vehicle communication network. So the vehicle communication network is looped through this connector. Next. So now we're going to get to the post-repair completion scan results. After that inspection, it was determined that that module needed to be replaced and that uh, uh, connector repair. So after that was done, vehicle reassembled. Next. And then next. So now we notice that the modules that were missing for the pre-scan and uh, uh, we're not communicating are now communicating. So now we've got our electronic brake control, our power steering module, our front heated seats, and a lot of the modules that were assumed to be uh, optional modules have now come back uh, alive on the system. And then we see this code, and I talk about some of the calibrations on the left side object detection module, the B101 electronic control unit software. That is an indication that that module needs to be programmed. And then we've got the codes that came up from the module, uh, from the bumper being off, uh, from the uh, park assist sensors, uh, all four of them coming up. And then also we've got the right side object control module, which works in conjunction with the left side module. But the good news is, is this repair was identified and we found the information. Module programming was done on this vehicle using General Motors SPS programming, which is a subscription service from General Motors and is ran uh, through a PC application and using a uh, compatible vehicle communication interface. So next, we got scan results after programming, code clear, and reinitializations. Next, we should have the list there in front of us. Yes. So now we've got all all of these systems are clear. The uh, the object detection has been programmed, and that now shows clear. Shows clear. Next, and then we have two non-related codes remain. And uh, these are documented and advised to the customer. Uh, so a cu customer with, uh, they're going to be having issues with the remotes because of these transmitter batteries. Uh, so adv advice to the customer to uh, check their remotes and their key fobs and replace batteries or key fobs is going to be needed for their uh, remote operation to work properly. Next. So with, with that uh, particular car, I found that a very interesting case study uh, for, for several reasons. Uh, uh, one is that uh, it points out the option content. It points out that the diagnostic trouble codes by themselves really doesn't show us what needs to be done on the vehicle and how much analyzing of the system needs to be done in order to, uh, to get to the root cause of the problem and fix the car right the first time. So now that we got the car fixed, we get into the documentation, and this is important to uh, get your files with the documentation to keep them electronically uh, or in paper, whatever uh, fits your organization best. Next. So I want to make sure that we document, document what we started with and what we found. Next what parts were replaced, what parts we repaired, and what parts were removed and reinstalled. Uh, so as far as when we're using service information, uh, knowing this, this is what's gonna lead us to the calibration and programming events that need to be done with the scan tool. 
Next. What OEM service information says. We need to document that. If there's any of the repairs that are done on the vehicle, uh, like the mounting of a module, the change of a thrust angle, the service information says that a calibration must be performed or something needs to be re-zeroed, uh, you need to make sure that it was done and where it's stated in the OEM service information. Next. Document the diagnostic procedures you performed. It is uh, my opinion that a lot of it, uh, a lot of procedures are done to vehicles finding problems that don't get documented and don't get uh, uh, fully compensated for, especially when it comes to things like wire repairs, connector repairs, those kind of things. So it's, uh, we need to make sure that we uh, document what we did on the physical diagnostic procedures, uh, including with what we did with the scan tool. So we document the next. We need to document the calibrations that we performed. Next. And then we need to document the functional QC test results. Next. And last but not least, we want to document what we did not do. And these are the non-related issues on the vehicle. And this is for the customer and for you to protect yourself as well. Uh, things if we did not replace a battery and we advise the customer that the battery is old and could potentially fail, we want to make sure that we document that and why uh, with the uh, with repairs, especially in relation to pre-existing conditions. Next. So we should be on a diagnostic database. Yes. So the diagnostic database, and uh, this is something we've been working on and uh, several other companies are working on as well. So a diagnostic database stores recommendations made from certified master technicians for DTCs uh, or symptoms analyzed during a scan or during a repair analysis. Next. The database will populate uh, when used properly on subsequent models of vehicle scans that match the DTT year make and model with the recommendations for further development and artificial intelligence integration which will be uh, coming in the future. I'll go a little bit further into that as we get towards the end. Next. These diagnostic databases and collecting this data and documenting it properly is, uh, will make it possible for predictive diagnostic results based on vehicle damage. So with that possibility, with vehicles same year, same, same model, with damage in the same area, it will be possible to predict what we expect to see with a scan tool and symptoms on that vehicle, what repairs will be needed, which will improve our processes further in the future. Next. So it should be on the privacy screen. Yes. So on, uh, on, on privacy, it's a uh, uh, touch on this, and it, this is a, uh, a big topic within the industry is the privacy of the vehicle's data. Uh, so a, a customer needs to give you and needs to know that you're going to be accessing this data on their vehicle and all the data for that matter. So it's, uh, uh, my advice when it comes to privacy is to incorporate into your work authorization a statement for the customer, letting the customer know that you're going to be accessing all types of data from their vehicle, from electronic data, measurement data, service information on the vehicle, for the, pur for the purpose of making repair decisions or claim-related decisions working in conjunction with their insurance carrier. Uh, so it's uh, and and you need to have that documented and signed by the customer. Uh, so you can use a separate uh, a separate document to uh, advise the customer this is uh, being done, but uh, it's a, in my opinion the uh, vehicle work authorization form is the best place to do this. Next. So that's. Uh, pretty much the end of what uh, I've got on the uh, presentation with the exception of artificial intelligence. And I uh, just want to give you a little bit of, a, of an opinion on artificial intelligence that I have. And this is my own opinion. 
uh, not necessarily the industry or my company, but uh, artificial intelligence is uh, kind of an oxymoron in my opinion. So if it's intelligent, how can it be artificial? And uh, if it's artificial, it's not really intelligence. And, uh, however, understanding how this term is going to be used is inputting this data and collecting this data so that we can use machines and machine learning uh, to get us closer to the point so that we can add our own intelligence to making uh, uh, repair decisions is going to be a benefit uh, for us as repairs, uh, labor shortage, and all those kind of things as we go on in the future. And uh, with that, that's uh, all ended at that point. Uh, I have I have a question. Uh, is it, what is the EPA requirement for uh, J2534 boxes to the aftermarket? For J2534, uh, and on that, what they require so that. That specification uh, was adopted in two different places. So first with the Massachusetts Right to Repair Act, uh, which went into place, I can't remember exactly uh, which year, it was a few years back. And then it was adopted with a memorandum of understanding uh, with ETI, NASIF, and the auto manufacturers to self-regulate this access uh, to vehicle information, which covers both service information and access to tools and tooling uh, so that uh, independent repair facilities would have the same access to the same tools that are available at a dealer franchise location. Okay, we have another so one. Those are the, the, okay, now go ahead, finish. I thought you Yeah, and uh, that the memorandum of understanding, if you uh, visit nastf.org, website there's a wealth of information on uh, on that well website in relation to j2534 oem access and the right to repair act okay uh, another question is who determines if specific codes are accident related that is a uh, that's a really good question and uh i actually like that question so it's uh, uh earlier on we spoke about some of the data that we can retrieve which is uh, frequency counters snapshot or freeze frame data uh, that can be an indication from the person scanning the car comparing the data uh, if it's available, not all scan pools and all vehicle network systems are capable of showing that to you. But when it is there, uh, that can be very definitive in determining that that code or that symptom was present before the date of loss. Uh, so that, that would be a determination from the scan pool itself that it's not related. Uh, but the, uh, the final determination is with the results from the scan, in relation to the inspection of the vehicle. So it's a, uh, I'll use an example that uh, uh, we see a lot for a, uh, like an oxygen sensor. Uh, you may have a vehicle that was hit in the, uh, in the left front, uh, didn't get into the engine compartment and you have an O2 sensor code or an O2 sensor heater code and it appears non-related until you make the close visual inspection of that O2 sensor and inspect the wire harness leading to it and the sensor itself to make sure it wasn't damaged in the collision event, uh, you're not complete on relating whether that code is indeed related or not. And these are the, the cases when you're lacking freeze frame or failure records of that particular code. Okay. Uh, another questionnaire, is the OEM certification programs like General Motors and Subaru recognizing uh, Air Pro, uh, will we have access to the recording? Oh, that's another one question. So that's two questions. Uh, so, so it's uh, with the certification programs that, uh, uh, to, and and that's specific to uh, uh, to Air Pro. It's uh, with Air Pro has been reviewed by General Motors and General Motors engineering teams. Uh, and has been uh, uh, demonstrated to them using General Motors GES2 software with the compatible J2534 interface and uh, with comparance with uh, comparative uh, to the tools that are being used at the engineering department 
that it is compatible and meets the uh, meets the requirements for the certification program for General Motors. Uh, that is pending a uh, an update on the General Motors certification list at this time. Uh, Subaru, in particular, is also uh, in its point of review uh, demonstration using Subaru SSM4 software uh, with the AirPro remotely has uh, has already occurred and has uh, uh, passed engineering and due diligence is being done with the collision certification program. Okay, well, thank you. This, is, uh, this has been great. Uh, I wanna thank you, Chuck. Uh, it was a great presentation. Uh, you know, I apologize to the audience for the few little technical difficulties that we had during the, during the presentation and got out of sync a little, uh, little bit at times. Uh, but then, anyhow, this concludes today's SikaCast. Uh, please check our lineup of SICA casts for 2019 by visiting the events tab on the SICA website. Uh, also on that tab, you will find our annual conference, Connects 2019. Uh, it will be held September 16th to the 18th in Charlottesville, Virginia. Uh, please go to the, uh, uh, to this, uh, the URL, uh, SICAConnects.com. Uh, at Connects, in addition to the information uh, uh, sessions that we will have, a tour of the IIHS Insurance Institute for Highway Safety Facility. Uh, this will be one conference you don't want to miss. You'll be able uh, to see a lot of things in terms of you'll be able to see the uh, connected car. Uh, they, they've got a track. I think it's like under five acres, under 10. So we'll be able to get to see that. Uh, if you are uh, if uh, if you're interested in AMI credit. Uh, anyone who wishes uh, to receive the credit, uh, please do so by going to their website and taking the test. Uh, and don't forget to follow us, uh, uh, follow Sika on Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn. Thank you for keeping abreast of the Sika developments. Our standards are built by volunteers from all industry segments. For those of you that contributed to our standards, we thank you. Uh, if you have not uh, yet been involved and would like to participate, please contact Charlie Quartz, Stacy Phillips, or myself. Thank you, and have a great day. Thank you.